Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a special presentation on breast cancer, as you see. Uh, before I bring uh, the speaker and the introducer uh, up to the stage, a couple of announcements. First of all, Clay Smith, one of our chief residents, has put together the second Department of Medicine Happy Hour. I'm sure you'll be happy about it. Uh, it will take place tonight at 6 o'clock at Patrick O'Shea's downtown. He says it's at the Bourbon Cellar, so you can imagine what's down there. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity for uh, faculty and trainees to get together in an environment outside of an auditorium. Uh, so take the opportunity to do that. Number two, the EDPRI is setting a number of meetings with people to learn about uh, more about research and how to deal with research at this organization in the future, and I've been asked to be there this morning. So I'm going to leave a little early, and Dr. Don Miller is going to continue the discussion at the end. Uh, a few points about history. This seems to be the day of a lot of fathers or founders. And let me go quickly through this interesting list. Today was the birth in, 19, uh, in 1789, 1789. September 28th, of Richard Bright, who's known as the father of nephrology. That coroner is always happy about that. He was the first to describe the manifestations of Bright's disease, which is nephritis, and he's considered the father of nephrology. Today, in 1954, was the death of George Harrison Shaw, who's a father of hybrid corn. And he was very interested in alleles and cross-fertilizing corn and he developed uh, sweet corn and was a big boom for commercial farmers. He died on this day back in the 1950s. Edwin Powell Hubble of the Hubble Telescope died on September 28th of 1953 and he described, he's known as a founder or father of extragalactic astronomy and he described extragalactic nubula, which we, nebula, which we call galaxies, and he measured the distances, and that's become sort of the basis for modern cosmology. Willem Ithomburn won the Nobel Prize in 1924, and I consider him the father of electrocardiography since he invented the EKG. Louis Pasteur died on this day in 1895, the founder, father of microbiology. But today, these are all men, and today our speaker is a woman. And for this generation, we have become accustomed that women drive medicine and many other areas. But it wasn't always that way. And you should know that back in 1865, on this day, Elizabeth Anderson had an oral exam on medicine, midwifery, and medical, medical pathology. And she had to study medicine at home, privately, because nobody would accept her in a medical school. And on that day, she was one of two, one of seven people, but only two actually received the final certificate to become the first female licensed physician in Britain on this day. And now with you, I leave you, Dr. Don Miller, Chief of the Cancer Center of the Division of Hematology and Oncology, to introduce our special guest. We're in for a treat today, I believe. Uh, Beth Riley is a Kentuckian. She was the daughter of, is the daughter of a prominent Kentucky oncologist. I don't have the touch. No. Beth grew up in Paducah, uh, went to Duke undergraduate, came to Louisville for medical school, and then went to Boston and trained in the Harvard system in the Beth Israel, uh, in the BI Deaconess program, was chief resident, did her fellowship there, and we were very, very lucky in 2009 to attract her here, where she's established a very, very busy breast cancer practice. She's done a wonderful job. In, in developing a practice, getting involved with clinical trials. On a national level, she's very involved with the Health Disparities Advisory Group of the American Society of, of uh, Clinical Oncology and, and developing a presence in that field. And she's going to talk to us today about her interest in screening and or, uh, detection and treatment of breast cancer. Okay?
turn this on because I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about a concept called overdiagnosis in breast cancer. So today we're going to outline and define uh, overdiagnosis and treatment, uh, look at the role of mammography and also breast cancer biology in overdiagnosis, look at DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in situ, as an example of overdiagnosis, and review the current efforts to reduce both overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So, the, you know, the concept of cancer is very complex, and um, our understanding of cancer has developed over time from, you know, a cell that mutates and becomes a bunch of cells to really um, a molecular uh, and biochemical pathway, uh, which is very complicated. But our, and our treatments have evolved to reflect that. We have much more targeted therapy, much less cytotoxic therapy, uh, especially in breast cancer. But one thing that hasn't really seemed to evolve with the same pace as um, both our understanding and our treatment is the public's perception of cancer. And you, and you all know this after taking care of patients uh, in the hospital, newly diagnosed with cancer. Oftentimes, um, most of the time, uh, they, even if it's early stage disease, highly curable, they say, Doc, I know there's no cure. You know, I know there's nothing you can do. Uh, and that's just not true. There are some cancers, yes, that remain um, uh, deadly remain late stage disease of diagnosis, but we have evolved in uh, several aspects of oncology and are able to help patients live longer and uh, in some cancers, especially breast cancer, even able to cure these women. So I'm going to talk to you about sort of the hypothesis of, of, uh, the, of overdiagnosis and how this thought process came about. So, you know, cancer is very heterogeneous, and this is a, a review by Welch, who's actually one of the leaders in the field of overdiagnosis, looking at different ways in which a cancer cell may progress. So, here's the uh, point in time with an uh, abnormal cell, and this is what most of the um, public's and um, perception is of cancer. We have a rapidly growing cell causing symptoms and then quickly leading to death. So, you know, there are some cancers who follow this pattern. Uh, leukemia, AML, left untreated, small cell lung cancer, types of lymphoma uh, do behave this way. Then we have an abnormal cell here growing a little bit more slowly, causing symptoms here, and then has a little bit longer until the state at which cancer may cause death. And I would say that this is more solid tumors or tumors from uh, organs like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, colon cancer, etc. And then you have some tumors that grow incredibly slow um, that they never even cause symptoms and the patient dies of something else before it's even brought to light. And then there is some theory that you have actually non-progressive cancer, so an abnormal cell that grows to this point in time and then sort of just stabilizes in this abnormal state, and some may even regress, and there is some interest in this and in try to identify what are the characteristics of these cancers. So overdiagnosis is a term used when the condition uh, is diagnosed that would not otherwise go on to cause symptoms or death, uh, so the cancer never progresses, may regress, or progresses slowly enough that the patient may die of something else. So again, looking back at this uh, diagram, I would label these two uh, pro projections as overdiagnosis. So just to review sort of the evolution of thought about breast cancer specifically and, and more and more solid tumors, um, there is an old evolution of thought and a new evolution of thought. Um, the old is that stage determines outcome. Uh, and that cancer progresses in an organized fashion. And that just isn't true. Uh, in breast cancer specifically, which I'll go over in a second, biology can trump stage. So how aggressive a cancer is varies based on its subtype. That, that subtype determines its prognosis, its treatment, and the rate of response to treatment. So looking at breast cancer specifically, there are uh, six, five to six distinct subtypes of breast cancer that have distinct clinical characteristics. Um, so you'll see in the breast cancer literature, these are described as luminal A and luminal B. Now most of you all are familiar that we classify breast cancer based on three um, parameters, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 nu. So the luminal A is the most favorable. This has a lower proliferative rate and a lower relapse rate. 
So luminal A typically has a high estrogen receptor percentage and a high progesterone receptor percentage. So you would expect to see on the pathology report that this would be something like 80% to 100%, uh, both estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. A luminal B cancer has a lower ER and a lower PR. So you might see anywhere from 20% to 70%, and you might call this a luminal B. This has a slightly higher proliferative rate and a higher relapse rate, and is also less responsive to our targeted therapies, anti-estrogens, such as tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. You will see um, examples of, of uh, breast cancers that are very high estrogen receptors, such as 100%, that have zero progesterone receptor, and those are less favorable than 100 and 100. Then we look at HER2 nu. So HER2 nu is an extracellular um, signaling uh, on the surface of uh, the cell that is uh, targeted by trastuzumab or Herceptin. Uh, and so you can have some, some breast cancers that are estrogen receptor positive, that's where we get the luminal, and also HER2 positive. Then you have those that are HER2 enriched, but estrogen receptor negative. And finally, triple negative are also called basal cell. Or, uh, basal cell. So um, again, these are more uh, unfavorable, have a higher proliferative rate, and as a response to that, are more responsive to chemotherapy. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think of this as a more favorable breast cancer, which is uh, correct, and they think that that's really the reason that we exclude chemotherapy, and that is one of the reasons. But the other reason is that chemotherapy is not really effective in these people because of this lower proliferative rate. Cytotoxic chemotherapy really works by um, attacking DNA synthesis, and if you have cells that are at rest, then those cells are going to evade the, the target of the chemotherapy. Whereas these cells have a higher proliferative rate and they're more responsive to chemotherapy. So just to sort of uh, drive home the biology of Trump stage, looking at this, if you had a stage three luminal A, so that's a woman with four more positive lymph nodes, um, and compared her to a stage two triple negative, that's um, you know what, either one to three lymph nodes, the, the stage uh, two triple negative is gonna have a much worse outcome than the stage three uh, luminal A. And so really our understanding of this um, has evolved over the last 10 years and really dictates treatment and uh, dictates intervention. So just to sort of point out that, that I believe that these are very distinct diseases, their timing of relapse is also very different. So you see for a luminal A, the timing of relapse uh, can be five to 15 years after the original diagnosis, whereas a triple negative uh, basal or HER2 enriched is most likely in uh, three to five years. You know, I, I can never tell a woman with ER positive breast cancer that she's cured because there are cases in the literature of somebody relapsing 20 to 40 years later. Um, but, you, but once time passes with the triple negative and HER2 positive, it's much easier to suggest that that woman has been cured. Their sites of metastases also vary. So estrogen receptor positive disease most commonly metastasizes first to the bone. HER2 uh, new overexpressed metastasize more commonly to the liver and to the brain. Uh, and triple negative metastasize most commonly to the lung and the lymph nodes. So these are really distinct clinical uh, entities. So looking again at, the, at our diagram about the heterogeneity of cancer progression, uh, now apply those subtypes to this uh, diagram. So I would classify uh, triple negative breast cancers, that's estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 new negative, as well as HER2 new overexpressed, go in the FAST category. More favorable luminal A and B go in the slow category. In this very slow category, you're gonna have some luminal A cancers, but you're also gonna have ductal carcinoma in situ, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then in this theoretical category of non-progressive, I'm gonna show you maybe some of this DCIS, maybe even some of this luminal A can be classified as this. So this all plays into what you all probably saw on the news on Monday um, with uh, the breast cancer genome being mapped. And so this is in the Courier Journal, the Nightly News, Yahoo, New York Times, it was everywhere. It was a, a result of this article in Nature about comprehensive molecular portraits of human breast tumors. And so what this is is really the DNA structure and the molecular structure of these clinical uh, entities that I've just talked about. So why this is exciting in breast cancer is because we're going to better understand from a genetic level how these cancers are different, and that's going to allow us to target therapy to be more effective and less toxic. So again, treatment has evolved to address this heterogeneity. We see for the estrogen receptor, we have targets such as tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors. Uh, for HER2 new overexpression, we have trastuzumab. 
More recently, we have Pertuzumab and coming down the pipeline is TDM1, which is very excited and maybe I'll be invited back to talk about that someday. Um, so tumor uh, treatment has evolved, but our screening and our public health message still consistently is one size fits all. So now we're going to look at screening, biology, and overdiagnosis. So just, I'm sure you all saw this in a med school textbook somewhere along the way, but just to talk about screening and how it's effective. So um, there's concepts such as, excuse me, there's concepts such as lead time, which is the time of, uh, gained of sort of awareness that the patient has cancer based on when the cancer was caught from the screening. But then there's also sojourn time. There's a, there's a time when the disease is present, but not um, picked up on either a uh, molecular or microscopic uh, level, or excuse me, clinical or microscopic level. Um, and this period, is, until when it's clinically detected, is called the sojourn time. So now you can imagine, um, based on the heterogeneity diagram that I showed you, that different breast cancers have different sojourn times. So this varies by age and histology. So younger premenopausal women have much shorter sojourn times. They tend to have cancers that have a higher proliferative rate, whereas postmenopausal women, if they have luminal A or B, have a lower proliferative rate cancer and therefore have a longer um, sojourn time. So the knowledge of sort of what this sojourn time is important to look at what our screening interval should be and how this is affected. So you see depicted here, the sojourn time varies in the literature, but age 40 to 49, is the shortest with 2 to 2.4 uh, years, all the way up to age 70, 40 to 4.4 uh, 4. 4 years. So when a screening interval exceeds the mean sojourn time, this is when we have a higher potential rate of something called interval cancers. So let's look at this graphically. So this is taken from Esterman, who's another leader in sort of the overdiagnosis discussion. Um, and it mirrors the heterogeneity diagram from Welch. So what we see here is we have tumor A, um, which is a very, uh, here, microscopic level um, all the way to screening time. You can see that um, here it's microscopic, so still not picked up by uh, mammogram, where it's localized to the organ, so it's present in the breast um, here. So you see that tumor B is picked up by screening. Tumor C is also picked up by screening because of its low growth rate. Um, and, and just to note that these are the screening intervals, but tumor D, even though the woman did exactly what you told her to do, she had her mammogram here, and then one year later, not a day sooner, had her mammogram here, this cancer was missed. And this is not a failure of mammography, this is the sojourn time, this is the biology of this cancer, which just grows rapidly, so it's not going to be detected by, excuse me, by mammogram. So tumor C and tumor um, B, or tumor C uh, benefits from screening, tumor D is an uh, interval cancer, and then we wonder about tumor B. Could this be overdiagnosed? So this graph, you know, we don't see where this graph ends. So if this remains localized to the breast and never metastasized, this is never life-threatening to the person. But it's quite possible, given the trajectory of this, it'll eventually have regional and metastatic spread. So this could either be overdiagnosis or early detection. So again, looking at the um, heterogeneity diagram from Welch, uh, we see benefits from screening in favorable biology breast cancers. Um, and uh, interval cancers are most commonly HER2 new, triple negative, uh, and then overdiagnosis, some DCIS and luminal A. Now, I don't want you to think that all HER2 overexpressed cancers are interval cancers, because they're not. I have several women in whom uh, their cancer was diagnosed by mammogram, and that's simply because if you shift this screening time to here, it's just you can detect this, this uh, cancer. So it just depends on when the cancer starts to grow and when her mammogram was. Uh, but if I have a woman who comes in with a palpable mass in between mammograms, it's most likely that that cancer is HER2 overexpressed or triple negative. So what is this, what pro, how big is this overdiagnosis problem? So it's been quoted in the literature anywhere from 1 to 30 percent, but most studies report a range of 1 to 10 percent. Overdiagnosis uh, actually occurs more frequently in older women due to competing comorbidities, um, and, and um, this is really a topic that we should uh, talk further about because um, when to stop screening is often as controversial as when to start screening in um, women. So, you know, I don't want to send the wrong message. Uh, Overdiagnosis is not purely a screening problem. 
Um, it's not it's solely an age issue. It's not solely an interval issue. This is an issue of the biology of the underlying cancer and our understanding of the natural history of this disease. I believe in risk adaptive screening starting at age 40. And the reason I do is because I believe that screening and adjuvant therapy saves lives. So this is a, um, an article by Barry in New England Journal from 2005, which looked at sort of when we picked up and started to use mammogram. Mammogram sort of came onto the scene and, and with any frequency around 1985, but you can see at that point, um, most of the women, around 75% of women, still never got a screening mammogram. Uh, in 1990, we sort of see that pick up, 95, and with each year, more and more women are getting um, regular screening. Also, our knowledge of breast cancer treatment has evolved significantly over the past several years. So in 1980, I mean, we, we didn't really know what we were doing compared to today uh, because we were giving a lot of chemotherapy uh, with tamoxifen. We were giving one or the other. Uh, now we're giving uh, both if needed. And, um, um, and so sort of the tick with which we started to do things correctly was around 1995. So it's not all over diagnosis where we wouldn't see this decline in mortality. So again, remember 1995, we started to have a decline in breast cancer mortality in 1990. Um, and so I think that uh, this mortality decline is really due to stage shift. I think screening is doing what it needs to be doing, but just as sort of a result of screening, we have this new concept of overdiagnosis. And so uh, let's look at that a little bit more closely. Okay, so the most, in my mind, the most common place that overdiagnosis happens is ductal carcinoma in situ. So just to review, this is what a normal duct uh, looks like. You have a nice little uh, line of cells around the duct. Here's ductal hyperplasia, which is a benign finding. You have a couple little extra cells. A typical ductal hyperplasia, which is a marker of risk for breast cancer, where the cells look a little bit more disorganized. And here's ductal carcinoma in situ. Here's invasive breast cancer, where the cancer cells are outside of the uh, exterior of the duct. And then here's um, DCIS with microinvasion, where you have these teeny tiny cells sticking out. So, you know, it's long thought and still thought today by a lot of people that ductal carcinoma is the uh, precursor to invasive <coughs> breast cancer. And because of that, we've treated it the exact same way as invasive breast cancer. But these patients never require chemotherapy. That's because patients never die of ductal carcinoma in situ, so there's no justification for chemotherapy. So let's look at the trends in breast cancer incidence. Okay, so remember what I was saying about uh, screening around 1985 is when it started and then picked up all the way up to about uh, 1990. So you see, uh, as the incidence of breast cancer grows up, we have a tumor size actually uh, go up. Uh, small, small tumor size go up, which is consistent with the notion of screening, right? We're finding more smaller cancers because um, we're finding them earlier. But interesting, the size of bigger cancers is kind of flat, uh, as well as moderately sized cancers is flat. The distant disease remains flat, which is quite frustrating, actually, because we thought that, you know, we're going to catch all this early disease. We're going to have a concomitant drop in distal disease. Uh, we have this rise in local disease and a corresponding drop in regional disease. And I think this is where sort of screening works the best. We have stage shift from people who were previously regional disease. And what, a, what I mean by that is more lymph nodes involved uh, than local disease involved with the breast lung. But look at ductal carcinoma in situ. I mean, this is just exponentially higher. So in comparison to other diseases, which also have screening modalities, cervical cancer, the incidence goes down. Colon cancer, the incidence goes down. So why is this? So, so in screening in colon cancer and cervical cancer, um, you, you can remove the precursor lesion. So we remove polyps that may go on to cause colon cancer. We remove CIN, which may go on to cause cervical cancer. And we thought we were removing DCIS, which may go on to cause invasive cancer. But because of this rise in incidence and the, um, uh, the uh, not, so initially when you start screening, you expect a rise in incidence. But then you expect that to label out, level out and then eventually fall. So we never have that sort of decline in invasive breast cancer in breasts. And so that's led us to question, well, is DCS really the right thing that we should be looking for? 
the flip side of this is maybe the incidence of breast cancer really has increased, okay? And what, why could that be? Well, there's a lot of talk about hormone replacement therapy, and maybe that led to the rise and increase in breast cancer, and DCIS still is the precursor lesion. We just have more breast cancer because people are taking hormone replacement therapy, maybe. Uh, maybe it's diet. Maybe we're eating more you know, fatty foods, not a lot of lean vegetables and lean proteins. Maybe this is leading to the rise in breast cancer. Maybe it's the hormones that they put in chicken or, or milk. Who knows? Uh, is it lifestyle? Is it obesity? Is it smoking? Maybe. Um, you know, interesting when you look at the role of hormone replacement therapy. In 2002, when the Women's Health Initiative results came out, um, the prescription rate for uh, estrogen and progesterone as hormone replacement therapy dropped by 60%. And starting around 2005, we started to see a decline in the incidence of invasive breast cancer. So some of these things are playing a role. But remember the, the exponential rise of ductal carcinoma in type 2. I don't believe that all of this related to that the dramatic rise. So the pink phenomenon, right? So everybody knows about pink. Everybody knows about the walk. Everybody knows about the army of pink. So this has led to a big awareness within women about breast cancer and um, awareness and, and mammograms and self-exam. And this has risen to sort of more detection of breast cancer uh, from a woman's standpoint. And then medical legal environment. I mean, I think uh, there's this big fear among providers about missing cancer. This is a huge reason for lawsuits. And so maybe we're a little bit more aggressive about following up on an abnormal mammogram uh, than really is clinically justified. So I believe that not all DCIS will lead to invasive cancer or would have seen a concomitant rise in the invasive disease, which we did not. Which leads to a, how can we differentiate this DCIS that may be a marker of risk for cancer but is not actually cancer. And for the DCIS that does turn into cancer, what type of, what type of cancer in those uh, five subgroups does it turn into? And that will help sort of guide how quickly we need to treat it. You know, I found this on the, on the website, and this is a blog of a woman who had DCIS. And most of her blog was about um, sort of within the pink community, she felt almost shunned because she just had DCIS. And she had gone through all this treatment and bilateral mastectomy and, and reconstruction and, and the psychological devastation of having a breast cancer diagnosis. And maybe for her, her DCIS would have been life-threatening. It sounded like she was premenopausal. She was probably young, maybe with a more aggressive breast cancer. But I wonder about all those women who probably don't have the dangerous kind of DCIS and, and, we're, and, we're, and we're psychologically turning them into cancer survivors when they, they may have never had a, a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. So just to look at this fuzzy border of, of cancer non-malignancy, we need to really understand, well, what's the natural history of DCIS? So Vanderbilt and the affiliated hospitals did, took um, retrospectively were reviewing some of their path reports and, and found about 28 women who had ductal carcinoma in situ but was never treated beyond original biopsy because at the time of original biopsy was not detected. And they went back and looked to see what happened to those women. So now remember, these, these women were treated with surgery alone, and that surgery was a biopsy. So they probably had positive margins for the DCIS. There's no way that these women got radiation, and probably most of them didn't get tamoxifen. So what happened? So follow-up was reported in 2005 with 31 years of the median follow-up. Um, the longest follow-up was 46 years. About 40% uh, of women developed invasive breast cancer, um, 11 out of 28. And these numbers are small, um, obviously, and, and we can't make a lot of confidence in terms of, of the natural history, but I want you to look at the years in which they developed. So seven women developed within 10 years of biopsy. One woman developed uh, invasive breast cancer within 12 years of biopsy. Three women, it took 23, 29, and 49 years, respectively. So the natural history is very indolent. Five of the 11 women died from metastatic disease, and six died from other causes. So some DCIS, obviously, is risky and should be treated. But there are some DCIS that may not be that risky. Uh, and, and, and the question becomes, when should we intervene on these people? So you know, I've reviewed the heterogeneity of breast cancer, but there's probably heterogeneity of ductal carcinoma in situ. So there's some uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia, which is a marker of risk that may turn into cancer. Um, DCIS, which is very slow growing and, and, and may never cause uh, symptoms or, or be life-threatening in some women. 
And though some BCIS, that probably progresses into cancer, but does it progress into a more favorable invasive breast cancer, or does it progress into some of these nasty breast cancers that we need to treat quickly? So I talked a little bit about this earlier, but there's a couple harms of overdiagnosis. One is the psychological ramifications of having a cancer diagnosis. One is a loss of insurance premiums, uh, or higher insurance premiums or loss of insurance. And I have several patients um, who actually lost their insurance after uh, a cancer diagnosis. Um, time taken off work for childcare uh, or taken off work for treatment. And then the cost to the healthcare system. So, but over treatment is probably the most obvious harm um, of uh, overdiagnosis. So what is the treatment for DCIS? So the current standard of care is lumpectomy, followed by radiation, followed by tamoxifen. <coughs> Some women opt to have a mastectomy, in which case radiation can be omitted, followed by tamoxifen. Standard of care for luminal A and B, remember that's estrogen receptor positive stage one and stage two cancers, is identical. Lumpectomy, followed by radiation, followed by tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. Uh, mastectomy, radiation only if lymph nodes are positive. Tamoxifen by an AI. So this is a lower risk disease, so shouldn't it equal less treatment? So how can we improve? So molecular profiling has really transformed a lot of cancer therapy uh, in the last five to 10 years, and it's really revolutionized the cancer of breast cancer treatment. So there are two uh, FDA-approved modalities of molecular profiling of invasive breast cancer called Oncotype DX and Mamoprint. So we use Oncotype DX or Mamoprint uh, when a woman has an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer but is lymph node negative. And the idea is to try to catch which women have a higher proliferative rate cancer that may require chemotherapy and in which women we can omit chemotherapy altogether. So this is uh, what it's reported in terms of a recurrence score, and it looks at 21 genes. So it has some reference genes uh, to make sure that the assay is correct, and then it has proliferation genes, KI67, uh, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, BCL2, and then HER2. Uh, and you can see each of these uh, genes are given a score. And notice here that the proliferation group is given a much higher score than anything else. So if you have a really good pathologist, and we're lucky at the University of Louisville because we have an excellent breast trained pathologist, she's probably the only breast trained pathologist in the city, she can report a KI67, and I can often guess what their oncotype recurrence score will be, but not always. So this is what it looks like. So a patient, uh, the, the tumor self it, uh, is sent to California, and then two weeks you get this report back, and they report a score. And you can either come back low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And again, this is validated in node negative ER positive breast cancer. And we have a clinical trial open here now looking at lymph node positive breast cancer and, and how to use this technology for those women. Uh, if it comes back low risk, there is no benefit from chemotherapy. <coughs> Excuse me. If it comes back high risk, there's definite benefit from chemotherapy. And again, this probably relates back to the proliferative rate. Cancer cells are growing very quickly. They're sensitive to chemotherapy. These cancer cells are rarely ever dividing, so you're giving chemotherapy, but it's not actually attacking DNA. These women we don't know what to do with. We have a clinical trial that, that was here that has closed, which will analyze uh, intermediate risk scores. They were randomized to chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus an antiestrogen, and we'll see what these women need. So again, remembering back about the proliferative rate and the heterogeneity of cancer, um, just to <clears throat> underscore that Oncotype is not indicated in a HER2 overexpressed breast cancer and a triple negative breast cancer. And that's because, again, the uh, proliferative rate of these cancers are so high, you would never omit chemotherapy in a HER2 overexpressed breast cancer patient or a triple negative patient. If you accidentally sent the oncotype, it would come back off the chart uh, in terms of too high. Uh, but for the women with luminal A or luminal B, uh, luminal A or luminal B cancers, um, they can be treated with a highly effective, non-toxic, targeted therapy. And Oncotype answers the question of eliminating chemotherapy and low-risk disease, and that corrects overtreatment. So again, luminal A or B, you'll see that they have a K67 of less than 10. Uh, excuse me, luminal A. Luminal B has a K67 of 15 to 20. And usually high risk group has a K67 of over 30. So there's a lot of interest in then applying this technology to DCIS. 
looking at the molecular profiling and see if we can identify which DCIS is risky and which DCIS is not. And so again, they use uh, some of the same genes uh, of Oncotype DX, but they only used 12 of them. And uh, they did this uh, on a set of patients as part of an ECOG trial where they were looking at actually eliminating radiation therapy in women with DCIS, uh, low-grade DCIS. And you can see that this is probably going to be technology that we use in the future. This is, uh, I forgot to mention that this is from an ASCO presentation. This is unpublished data, but was discussed at the ASCO clinical trial, excuse me, ASCO annual meeting. Um, and you can see that, again, this is any um, ipsilateral breast event. So this could be another DCIS, or this could be an invasive breast cancer. And then this is an invasive breast cancer. And I would argue this is really what we want to look at, because this is where we're going to make the most impact in terms of treatment and prognosis. And again, to underscore the natural history of DCIS, um, the 10-year risk of any invasive uh, event in midway through was quoted around 19%. And the uh, low risk is around 9%. Um, so, uh, so clinical, they, they, they wondered if clinical and pathological characteristics could be used. Could we skip the molecular profile? But unfortunately, there's just not consistency uh, in terms of outcome. There, there are, we generally look at a pathology report and we think women who have a low nuclear gray, not a lot of necrosis with a small tumor that was mammographically detected, those are less risky than a woman who comes in with a palpable mass, which on mammogram was found to be DCIS, which has a lot of necrosis. But this has never been consistent or reliable. Um, now, just to sort of put these uh, ipsilateral breast event rates into perspective, a woman's ab walk a woman walking on the street, no family history of breast cancer, her lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is about 12%. A woman who has uh, LCIS is quoted at 10 to 20% risk in the next uh, 10, 15 years. And a first-degree family member um, bumps that up to a 24% risk, lifetime risk. So. You know, these rates, these rates seem right on par with these rates. So should we change the label? You know, given the risk and I would argue the time to progression, should we really challenge the definition of DCIS as cancer? Perhaps this is better defined as a marker of risk. So this is a slide from Esserman out of discussion ASCO, which I just thought was really nice and sort of takes home what I think should happen, is that we should really look at the timing of progression and then determine what intervention we should take based on that timing. So if you have a woman who presents you with a breast cancer that's going to um, progress in the next month, you're going to treat that woman. If you have a woman who's going to be treated in the next 5 to 10 years or need treatment in the next 5 to 10 or 20 years, you may watch that woman and decide when to intervene later. The real um, question is what to do in these women. So what's going to happen in the next year or the next five years? And I would say that this is really going to depend on what the woman's preference is. Some women are going to want to be overtreated. I have plenty of women in my <coughs> clinic who want chemotherapy for a 1% benefit. So uh, this is going to this is going to depend on the patient. This is going to depend on the patient's comorbidities and what else is going on. And this is really, I think, where um, a relationship with primary care is going to be very helpful because patients are going to come to you and they're going to ask for your opinion because it's not going to be obvious what should happen. So I just want to put a plug in for chemo prevention because I think this is another avenue we could take with this low-risk ECIS. So NSADP uh, prevention trial one showed an 85% risk reduction for tamoxifen given in women who had atypical uh, findings on uh, biopsy. In the uh, trials that validated both tamoxifen and extamestane for uh, prevention in women who had uh, breast cancer, their contralateral breast cancer events was uh, close to 60% with tamoxifen, or reduction was 60% with tamoxifen and 65% with extamestane. So these drugs are incredibly powerful at preventing uh, invasive breast cancer. But of the potentially 2 million U.S. women who potentially benefit from tamoxifen, only about 4% are taking it. Why is this? A lot of people are worried about the side effects because it does cause uterine cancer uh, and it does cause a, a thromboembolic events, so DVT and PE. But the, the frequency with which these side effects happen is incredibly low, but the benefit really uh, outweighs the risk. 
so you know there's this there's a lot of stuff in the breast cancer literature about we should not call this chemo prevention because the fact that it has chemo in the word this really is preventive therapy so what can we do? Well, let's look at other low proliferative rate cancers as a model. So there's a, a lot of new buzz in prostate cancer about watch and wait. Um, CLL, follicular lymphoma, all of these are models that are well established of low proliferative grade tumors that oncologists watch and determine treatment based on progression of disease and symptoms at that time. DCIS probably needs to adopt this also. <laughs> Can we use the DCIS score and oncotype at the time of original biopsy to determine the treatment versus active surveillance? So what this DCIS oncotype score has been um, proven to do is to help sort of select people who can eliminate radiation. But what I would add as what should be the next focus of clinical trials is can we send oncotype on the biopsy specimen to get a molecular profile to say, hey, this cancer is not gonna progress in 10 years, let's just watch it. This woman's gonna get routine mammogram, uh, every year she's going to follow the DCIS, you know, we'll intervene when it looks like it's becoming threatening. Or pick out those cancers, nope, this is a premenopausal woman, her recurrence score is high, this DCIS needs to come out, needs to be treated with radiation and given to moxifen. The problem with this, and those of us who practice oncology know this when we treat low proliferative rate cancers, the public health message of early interventions is at odds with this <coughs> treatment recommendation. And so patients oftentimes are very uncomfortable watching and waiting uh, their cancer grow. So this, we need to sort of help educate providers and the public about, well, what are sort of the dynamics of this disease and when is it appropriate to intervene? Um, I would add even our own quality measures are at odds. So, you know, radiation for every DCIS is a, is a quality measure that we are supposed to um, provide. And uh, I didn't go into it here, but there are certain DCIS which radiation literature has, has justified the exclusion of radiation. So, you know, our quality measures, our public health message, they're not really fitting sort of what the natural history of this disease is. So uh, what can I do as a medical oncologist? Well, I'm really interested in neoadjuvant trials. So this is, you give the antiestrogen prior to surgery. So can we give these women who have DCIS, give them tamoxifen, give them aromatase inhibitors, and see what happens to this DCIS. Maybe it will regress on its own. I have several patients who are elderly with comorbidities who couldn't withstand surgery or radiation and came to me with an invasive breast cancer who have been on antiestrogen for three years with no progression of disease, and that's an invasive breast cancer. So we're really, again, looking at the biology. If the biology is safe, why not give them tamoxifen and see what happens? We need chemo, uh, chemo prevention or prevention to change the natural history of low-grade DCIS, and we need clinical trials to validate all of the above. So in conclusion, overdiagnosis is multifactorial. Mainly, it's a shortfall in our biological understanding of the natural history of this disease. Um, it's, a, it's a more urgent problem because of what screening has uh, provided. The public awareness of breast cancer has brought sort of this urgency to treat uh, to the table. The medical legal environment um, is such that, uh, you know, if, if there's calcifications on the mammogram, there's going to be action. Overdiagnosis causes overtreatment, psychological stress of cancer, and money to patient and the healthcare system. So, you know, treatment should really reflect the heterogeneity of this disease. Patients and providers need more education on the disease dynamics. The likelihood of what's going to progress, when it's going to progress, and what it progresses to. When to intervene is a function of the biology, the age of the patient, the patient's comorbidities, and the patient's preference. Chemo prevention is proven but underutilized and clinical trials are necessary to validate molecular profile, novel anti-estrogen approaches, watch and wait, and tailored therapy based on risk assessment. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Roman and the breast multidisciplinary team, none of which are depicted here. <laughs> thank, thank you for that wonderful uh, discussion. Any questions? Really heterogeneous, and when you do the molecular PCR phenotyping, it really depends on which portion of the 
So the, the score that the estrogen receptor percentage is from is from amino acid chemistry. And so it's basically just reported as a percentage of what the, the stain is taken up. But your question is interesting because it used to be thought that, you know, biopsy something and it's ER positive 100%, PR positive 100%, HER2 new negative, that was the diagnosis. Probably what happens is there's even heterogeneity within the cancer. And so if you biopsy different sites, you might get different um, profiles. So, you know, again, that's when molecular profiles can be helpful, but then begs the question, what part do you send? We tend to treat the most aggressive part of the cancer. So if we get something, one thing back that says HER2 negative, uh, and one thing back that says HER2 overexpressed, we're probably going to treat that patient with tamoxifen. But really the challenge of this for a medical oncologist, and, and I think what our multidisciplinary team does very well, is that we have a very deep understanding of the biology. And a lot of times we'll get outside consultations with a biopsy that, that, that based on the clinical presentation and what the pathological interpretation doesn't make sense. And to, to raise the question to review that pathology, and down here, oftentimes we change the diagnosis completely because there's a lot of problems with concordance in um, pathology. And, and you know, really, I, I, Marianne Sanders is a is a breast pathologist here, and it's excellent, breast pathology trained. And I, you know, everything I do is dependent on what the pathology says. So it's very important for me to understand this, to know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and to have Marianne help me sort of look into that. That was a very, very educational talk. That, that was really superb. To add, to add a wrinkle to this discussion of overdiagnosis uh, in DCIS, for the younger people in the audience, you know there was an article in um, the Annals, I believe, about 15 years ago, looking at pathological specimens and post-mortem studies of uh, women. And, they were, and you know what they found is that the finer the cuts examined and the more cuts for the breast exam and the higher the detection rate of DCIS. So, so pathologists who were putting in very fine cuts in a great number of samples found DCIS rates as high as 15% in mm-hmm. women aged 40 to 70 who mm-hmm. died of other causes. And so, you know, so you turn them over diagnosis or as, as imaging modalities are, as imaging modalities are becoming more sensitive as we're having you know, greater reliance on MRIs for higher risk women, are we looking at a, at a time when we're going to be biopsy and do the decisions and genetic testing on 10 to 15 percent of the female population in this country and putting lots of money. Probably. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But yeah, your point is right about the DCIS and autopsy rate. And the same, the same has been shown about uh, prostate cancer. Yes. And I think, though, the prostate world has done a much better job um, at adapting the watch and weight and I think educating patients and providers about what that is. And so, you know, the goal of mammography is to reduce morbidity and mortality from, from breast cancer. But but as a result of better technique, we're recognizing more DCIS. So, you know, how do we how do we bridge that gap and make it easier on the mammographers that they don't have to follow every DCIS? Um, can we, yes, we're probably going to have to boxy any concerning finding, but maybe we can simplify things before we get there and even after there. So the alternative is that every person gets uh, mastectomy, double mastectomy, radiation. You know, that's the alternative. So I think a biopsy and molecular profiling sounds pretty good from my standpoint. But you're right, we do need better sensitivity and specificity. We need better specificity of the mammogram to, to help differentiate those things. Yeah, to, to your point about you know, the goal of reducing um, mortality, the study that you showed the reduction of mortality in breast cancer, I think, I mean, it, it was a quick look, but it, it seemed like over the years there's just been a reduction of maybe five to ten cases per 100,000 women. I mean, it's, these aren't drastic reductions of mortality. No, but I mean, the, the number of women who actually die of breast cancer is around the same, but the incidence uh, going up is different. So. It's, it's hard to say. The, the thing about breast cancer is even though the percentage numbers are small, the number of actual women, because the number of women diagnosed with breast cancer is so big, that translates to a lot of women. Historically, it took a lot of lobbying to get mammography covered by an insurance company. What is the current practice in terms of insurance coverage for the oncotype testing? Insurance is routinely paying for, including Passport, paying for oncotype DX testing with ER positive, lymph node negative breast cancer. 
You mentioned that uh, patients are sometimes uncomfortable with the watch and wait approach to things. I would imagine our legal people are also a little bit uncomfortable with that as well. But are there things in place that will sort of bring them on board and not make them uh, resist this kind of thing? From a medical legal standpoint, I don't know. I mean, I think in my patients, because my other hat is that I do a lot of hematology, so I have patients who have had the watch and wait discussion with, and and I just I just lay out the facts and I tell them the um, the benefit and the risk and I and I describe what therapy will be like and then I document that discussion and and I think that as the medical community more routinely adapts watch and wait. Um, Standard of care will change to be watch and wait, and then that will translate into the uh, medical legal issues. You said you believe in an individualized uh, screening strategy that starts the age of the week. Yeah. So, how do you combine the individualized screening with a simple public health message that catches as many people as possible in the country? I think. I think this is always this is always a difficult answer, and, and you know a lot is written in the literature about uh, we're going to harm the public health message, we're going to confuse patients. But I mean, we need to educate patients. I don't think we should withhold information from patients. I think that's why the risk that's why I put risk adapt is being so important. This is a discussion between provider and patient in terms of that patient's preferences, that patient's comorbidities, that patient's level of risk. And then I think it should be offered at 40, and maybe that should be the message. You should discuss mammogram with your provider starting at age 40. We have time for one more question, Ramesh. Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, you may have mentioned the beginning. Uh, are there any chemo prevention trials? I know this is like chemo prevention uh, for uh, high risk uh, uh, individuals, such as uh, mammographically diagnosed. Uh, well, the prevention trial, the latest prevention trial was was uh, MAP3, which justified extabestane, which is a wrong case inhibitor in prevention. And they looked at people with, uh, based, uh, most of risk is based on the Gale model. Breast density is sort of a new kid on the block in terms of risk. And so there are trials published about uh, what happens to breast density on tamoxifen and will that translate into things. So, you know, breast density is sort of the new kid on the block. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. It's a huge health disparity.